Okay. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks again for, for joining. i um, going to uh, start by just turning it over to Sarah Harari from the Green Bank, uh, just uh, with some opening remarks. Sarah? Thanks, Andrew. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we are quickly closing in on the uh, end of our uh, designated time together as, as part of this. And uh, I know that the Power Advisory team is going to be walking us through sort of the, the runway between what ha happens now and the filing date uh, that we have for Pierce on, on August 1st. Um, and thank you for everything that you've contributed so far to the discussion. Uh, we hope that the material that we're covering today is an accurate representation of the very nuanced discussion that we've been having over the course of the last few months. And, uh, you know, we welcome your comments on, on the draft that we put together and look forward to rounding out this uh, process in a, a strong way. So thank you again for your time this afternoon. And Andrew, I'll turn it back to you to get the discussion started. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to go through introductions, uh, and then we're going to have Avi uh, go over the recommendations that we've been uh, developing, and then talk about some implementation considerations, and then finally save some time for discussion. We'll have a chance for discussion as we go, but uh, also at the end of uh, uh, the slides that we present. So this is the fourth working group meeting. I think most people who are attending today have attended a prior meeting, um, but we would like to have new attendees um, introduce themselves. But before we do that, I did want to let people know that uh, the meeting is being re recorded. Uh, it'll be posted along with a copy of this presentation and meeting notes from this meeting uh, on our on our website, which is listed here on the uh, uh, on the screen. Um, and yeah, in terms of new attendees, if there is uh, someone who's attending for the first time that would like to introduce themselves, please go ahead. Uh, we just like to have you identify your name, your company name, and, and your role. So if there's anyone out there that would like to uh, introduce themselves, please, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I can. Uh, this is my first time joining. My name is Garrett Hoover. I'm the director of the O&M Supply Chain for uh, Sanova. Great, thank you, Garrett, for joining. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Okay, hearing none. Um, we've uh, we've seen this page before. This is just a, a list of the organizations that are sort of quote unquote official uh, working group members. Um, and we're happy to uh, add add uh, add any companies to this this list. Uh, this meeting is open to the to the general public as well. But uh, for the purpose of um, when we talk about the working group, we uh, we're we're specifically uh, referring to this uh, this group of organizations. Um, and then just a recap of the meetings that we've been having, and uh, we'll have today, and then and then a final one in July. So. Uh, you'll recall back in March, that's when we kind of uh, introduced this working group and uh, the objectives it had, and we looked at a jurisdictional scan. Uh, then in April, we went over uh, needs assessment, market readiness, and the policy landscape. And then last month, we looked at indicative economics, both on the solar panel side and the battery side and funding options. Today, we're going to look at these uh, uh, recommendations that we have developed, um, present some material and, and get your feedback on that. And then really for the next working group meeting, which is July 17th, which I think is three weeks from now, uh, will really be an opportunity to tie up loose ends and, and sort of uh, you know finalize things. Um, in terms of the discussion format, we're uh, we're not going to be using Slido today. We have on on previous calls, but won't be using it today. Um, in terms of how we like this to go, is that Avi will present some material, um, 
and then pause and open it up for questions. Uh, so we'd ask that you hold off on your comments until these breaks that happen along the way. If there's a particular question about a particular uh, slide um, that you, you know is 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 confusing or something or other, please please feel free to uh, to ask just so that we we all sort of you know are tracking properly. Um, but that's that's how we're planning to do this. And uh, um, we'd ask that you raise your virtual hand, and we'll just sort of go in order. Um, uh, after today's meeting, uh, you know, if there's if there's still questions outstanding, or if you'd like to email us, we'd be happy to to get back to you. Um, and then uh, it, it just some protocols we have here on the right, just uh, just to be respectful of um, of all the meeting attendees. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Avi. Uh, Avi, go ahead. Thanks, Andrew, and welcome everybody once again. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, the focus of today's meeting is going to be on the recommendations that are currently in a draft form, but which we've spent a lot of time thinking about on our end, together with the Green Bank, with the working group members, um, with DEEP, with uh, you know industry stakeholders and interviewees. So in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, we have five primary recommendations that we're going to get to in a couple of minutes. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, they're sort of the synthesis of all of the research that we have been doing. Uh, and they jointly represent uh, kind of our thinking and that of the Connecticut Green Bank. Again, they're still in draft form at this point in time. Uh, four of them are pretty similar to what was presented in the previous working group meeting, although we have refined some of them, and those are focused on the best end of life options for solar panels and batteries. And those are really intended as high level guidance to Pura that could form the basis for further stakeholdering and policy or program development. And we want to be clear as we're going through these recommendations that our intent is to lay the groundwork for future policymaking. And what we're, you know, we, we haven't gone into kind of a detailed implementation plan. And we we have flagged a number of additional items that we'll get to at a later point in today's presentation. Uh, items that we think need to be further fleshed out in order to, to bring these recommendations about. And then there's a fifth recommendation, what you might call complementary policies that would support the implementation of those uh, four end of life framework recommendations. And again, just to reiterate, because uh, you'll probably have questions as we're going through the specific recommendations to the last bullet on the slide here, uh, that there are many detailed implementation considerations that remain to be determined. And if there are other items that we have missed as we're going through, um, you are most welcome to, to chime in and let us know. Next slide, please. The guiding principles that we have been yep following through this process uh, are set out on the slide here. And those are you know, things like consistency with existing programs in Connecticut, stakeholder buy-in, lessons learned from other jurisdictions, minimization of environmental impacts, avoidance of kind of discrimination towards one or another party. We have given some consideration to the cost and timeline to implement, although those are items that also, uh, given the sort of newness of this type of recycling, those are things that are a little bit fuzzy still. And then the feasibility uh, in a kind of abstract way of getting the recommended frameworks and policies through the regulatory process. And you'll see that that's also something that we uh, are recommending further thought be given to. Next slide. There we go. This table should look pretty familiar because again, it's something that was uh, in, a, in a pretty similar uh, version to what you're seeing here was presented at the last working group meeting. And this is the recommendations or the draft recommendations for the end of life management frameworks for each of the four infrastructure types that you see on the left column there. So solar at the residential and commercial scale, and then stationary battery storage at the commercial and residential scale. Next slide. So the very first recommendation uh, is that there be the kind of segmentation that you just saw on the previous slide. And we're recommending that distinct solutions be designed for each of residential scale solar, commercial scale solar, and stationary battery energy storage systems on the battery side without distinction between uh, larger or smaller scale projects. And the rationale for that really is fundamentally because of the vastly different economics that are involved in recycling solar panels versus those of recycling batteries. Uh, really, they just lend themselves to 
uh, different end of life management options. And the observations that we've presented here are sort of the, the main ones that have led us to the conclusion uh, that we have for segmentation. And that is sort of the economic dynamics that I just mentioned kind of factor into the feasibility of recycling, the desirability of recycling. And that is ultimately, you know, a key determinant of the success of the recycling framework. Is it is it is it possible to do? And of course, on the consumer side, from the consumer's perspective, customers' ability to recycle also varies at the, you know, as you go to the smaller residential scale level, the ability and the desire and the ability to bear cost uh, is different than what you might see at the commercial and, uh, and utility scale project. So again, uh, these are the rationales for segmentation. We have considered another uh, number of other options. Those are on the next slide, if we could go to that. And you'll see this is, you know, in, in contrast to the previous working group meeting, we, we wanted to flesh out for the benefit of everybody here what other options we considered in coming to the conclusion that we did. So with respect to segmentation, uh, you can see on the slide here that we gave some thought to less segmentation, more segmentation, not segmenting at all. Ultimately, we came to the conclusion that we did. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go through each one of these cells here, but we came to the conclusion that we did because we felt it was the right balance of addressing the economic differences between recycling of batteries and solar panels, but also balancing the complexity on the part of the recycling industry, the regulatory process, the end-use consumer, etc. Next slide. Recommendation two is in respect of residential scale solar projects, and we've broken this down into two sort of sub sub recommendations. The first one that you can see on on the screen here is that Connecticut should adopt an advanced fee administration model for residential scale solar installations. Again, just to reiterate that these are high level recommendations. In this case, a fee would be assessed to some party. Who that would be precisely remains to be determined in advance of recycling. So at the time of system installation, purchase or energize, energization, and that would cover the cost of recycling or perhaps the cost of collection of solar panels and their subsequent recycling uh, at the residential scale. And the justification for going with this option uh, for residential scale solar is because the volume of panels is low and sporadic at present. They're dispersed across across multiple properties in different parts of the state, higher transportation costs to collect them and send them for recycling. And uh, what we understand to be an unwillingness or inability of homeowners to pay for costs at the end of life. So 20 or 30 years down the road, it could be quite challenging to explain to uh, residential, a residential homeowner you know, how, how they ought to come up with a potential large lump sum of money to pay for recycling when they've been enjoying the product for all these years. If we could go to the next slide. As a corollary to that, we're also acknowledging that there's a difference in many respects between third party owned residential systems versus host owned. And so we're recommending that on the third party systems, there also be formal end of life protocols implemented. So. The main distinctions that we've observed are third party owned systems generally would have a single owner with a large number of panels. They likely have an established network of labor for the installation and removal of panels. They may have logistics for the transportation and storage of panels. And of course, the panels are actually are, are deployed to the to the sites under contractual arrangements, which presents an opening to introduce uh, a recycling requirement in, in there. And one of the things that we've also observed is that while contracts with site hosts generally do contain some requirements obliging the owner to remove the panels at end of life, actually ensuring that they're recycled rather than just removed from the site or replaced or repowered is not necessarily a contractual obligation at present. And so therefore we're suggesting that formal end of life protocols should be developed and introduced for third party owned systems. Those could entail you know, requiring owners to demonstrate that they have an end of life management or recycling plan. We haven't gone so far in this recommendation as to suggest those actually ought to be approved, but as a first step, what we're suggesting is that the preparation of a plan that includes recycling uh, ought to be in, uh, a requirement for third party owned systems. Next slide, please. 
other options that we considered were um, you know, are, are set out here. The difference you know, was, was sort of, uh, in, in some respects, with respect to third-party-owned systems, as I mentioned, there are, they, they do resemble larger commercial or industrial systems in some respects, but of course, much as with other host-owned residential systems, they are dispersed at premises across the state. Because they may have been installed at different points in time, they likely are not going to all reach end of life uh, at the same time. And so we didn't recommend greater segmentation in, in respect of uh, residential solar panels. Next slide, please. On the commercial side, we're recommending that Connecticut should enhance the present model of decommissioning plans and bonds by requiring the preparation of decommissioning plans that include details of how panels will be recycled at end of life. So from our research, we understand that decommissioning plans are often required by lenders or asset owners for commercial scale infrastructure. And we viewed that as a good framework for overall end of life protocols. But we haven't observed strong language with respect to recycling specifically in those decommissioning plans. And as I think we mentioned at the previous working group session, we've had a hard time actually getting our hands on those plans. And there appears to be a wide degree of variations to what, what is in them. And that was of concern to us and to the Green Bank, because obviously at commercial scale, we're talking about much larger volumes of panels needing disposal at some point in time. Uh, and therefore, the, the lack of any clear guidance related to recycling of those panels was something that we felt ought to be addressed. We are going, you know, we do acknowledge that CI is developing a decommissioning standard. Uh, we haven't had a chance to review, review that and uh, so we can't comment on whether that will meet the needs of Connecticut at this point in time. It, it may well. And we'd also note that North Carolina is introducing requirements around recycling as part of solar farm decommissioning. Next slide, please. The alternative option for commercial scale solar would be to maintain the status quo essentially as is, where developers or investors are responsible for determining what, if any, decommissioning plan there is for a site, what has gone into that decommissioning plan, if recycling will take place, et cetera. It's not, pres it's not apparent to us at present how many panels are actually recycled under the status quo model. Uh, we've heard anecdotally from one recycler that you know a facility was being repowered and the entire site was basically shipped to them for recycling, which is obviously commendable from, from our perspective. But in the absence of further data, we really don't know whether that's the norm or an outlier. I do want to acknowledge we've heard from developers that prescriptiveness uh, around decommissioning plans could or perhaps would deter the development of commercial scale solar in Connecticut. And so uh, we're still sort of working through working through that. But the 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 alternative that we have not recommended at this point, but which which could be one way to um, help address that would be to introduce a reporting requirement as an interim measure. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we don't really have a great sense of how many panels from commercial and industrial scale projects are actually being recycled in Connecticut. And so uh, if, if it were felt that uh, going all in as we've recommended is, is, is not something that's feasible at the moment as a backup, Collecting data to better understand the lay of the land in state uh, would be one alternative. Next slide, please. With respect to batteries, uh, we're recommending, again, at both the residential and commercial uh, levels, an extended producer responsibility model for stationary batteries. I'll just remind the group that the scope of this project is for stationary batteries and that EV batteries are, are out of scope for our work. Not to suggest that this model couldn't work in the future were, were EV batteries to eventually be included in that. We also want to include in this recommendation measures to ensure that end use customers, as well as installers, contractors, et cetera, can readily access information about where and how to recycle batteries using the existing infrastructure. And an alternative option for producers to submit an end of life plan in lieu of participating in a broader or joint EPR framework, as long as that plan meets the basic requirements of whatever framework uh, is ultimately set up. And so on this recommendation, we, we really had, uh, you know, we really had our work cut out for us in balancing 
many different perspectives on battery recycling and the goals of the Connecticut Green Bank and ultimately the state. As we've previously observed, battery manufacturers are quite eager to retrieve and recycle the batteries. The material itself has a lot of value in today's market conditions. Uh, but as we also heard at the last uh, stakeholder, at the last working group meeting, uh, there is an existing model, largely with respect to lead acid batteries, that has much less government involvement, is much more market driven. Um, so we had to balance between between both of those. But one of the objectives that we also, you know, that the Connecticut Green Bank shared with us with respect to battery recycling was uh, to really be a leader in this in this matter. Next slide, please. In terms of the other options that we considered, they're set out here again. I, I don't think I'm going to go through every one of these cells and the presentation will be posted online as mentioned, but we could have kept a status quo or wait and see approach. Essentially, don't do anything at the moment. See how the battery storage market sort of shakes out in Connecticut and make a decision on a framework at a later date once there's more information available, particularly at the residential scale. We know that uh, stationary battery storage is, is quite uh, quite a small market at the moment, but expected to grow, of course. Uh, we considered an open market model much along the lines of the existing lead acid battery setup in which manufacturers would be required to participate in the collection and recycling of the batteries, uh, but without a formal EPR framework. We considered uh, an advanced fee setup similar to what we've recommended for solar panels at the residential level. And we also considered greater segmentation. And for the reasons that are set out in the third column here, we, we didn't recommend any of these, although the open market model, again, trying to balance all the different stakeholder perspectives that we heard, uh, the open market model did lead us to, to include these caveats that were mentioned on the previous slide um, of some alternative options that could be made available uh, under, under the broader EPR framework. Next slide, please. So those are the end of life framework recommendations. In addition, there are a number of supporting policy recommendations that have come out. And those are, you know, we're really viewing those as complementary or enabling to, to those, the four that we just presented. And those, there, there are four sort of sub recommendations and we'll go through those one by one. First of all, of course, this working group has been invaluable to us and to the Green Bank. And so we're, we're recommending that it be continued and brought under the auspices of Pura or Deep as appropriate because as you could see from the previous slides and as we'll get into again in a few minutes, there is quite a lot that will ultimately need to be sorted out if these recommendations are taken beyond recommendations and into act, you know, active policy development. And this, this, this working group would be an excellent source uh, to, to continue to feed into those uh, those recommendations and the ultimate policies. 5B, DEEP should launch a process to qualify and publish a roster of state-approved recyclers for batteries and solar panels. While all of the things that we've just talked about are, are getting worked out, while the frameworks are being stood up, etc., uh, the Green Bank and Power Advisory feels that it's important that consumers get access to some information and have some enhanced ability to recycle the materials, even in the absence of a formal framework. And one way to do that is to start connecting customers with recyclers. And so uh, a, a, an endorsement uh, qualification from DEEP would be, would be one way to do that. Next slide, please. We also think that DEEP should support the federal efforts that are already underway at the, at the EPA to make a formal determination on the waste classification of solar panels um, and ultimately urge the EPA to adopt the classification of universal waste for hazardous waste solar panels. So we have observed that universal waste, the universal waste classification has been extended to solar panels in some states, for example, in California and I believe Hawaii. And the EPA currently has uh, an open rulemaking uh, amendment process to classify hazardous waste solar panels as universal waste at the federal level. And so if Connecticut is not able to make that determination on, on its own, which we understand they, they cannot, then at, at the very least, we believe that DEEP should support the EPA's rulemaking efforts in that respect. And after that happens, to our understanding, uh, Connecticut would be able to adopt the EPA's classification into uh, domestic regulation. And then lastly, 
Connecticut should consider banning the landfill disposal of solar panels and batteries. Uh, from our understanding, from our research, in particular with respect to solar panels, there is currently no impediment to landfilling uh, those solar panels in in state uh, or for shipping to shipping them outside of the state for landfilling. Um, in other states, there have been moves to restrict or to outright ban landfilling batteries in particular, given the safety hazards that are associated with that. And this is something that likely requires further investigation. So we're suggesting that Connecticut consider the merits and also the downsides of a similar ban uh, for one or both of these technologies. I'm going to stop here uh, and take any questions or comments. Um, but before we open it up to the floor, I should acknowledge that the, the next two slides that we're going to get into will outline many of the gaps that still remain. And as I've suggested, will need to be uh, addressed or fleshed out as as the policy development process moves forward. But I'll stop here and uh, open it up to any comments, reactions, input, etc. And as Andrew noted, there is a discussion section towards the end of the presentation, which uh, I suspect will be coming up to in the next 15 minutes or so, if anybody is still thinking, thinking through their comments. Hearing none, we can move on to the next section. So implementation considerations, as I've suggested, alluded to, uh, stated pretty directly a number of times now, to move forward with implementing these recommendations, we readily acknowledge that there are a number of additional matters that would need to be resolved. Those are ultimately quite detailed policy implementation questions, and so their resolution likely would ultimately be a matter for Pura Deep and or the legislature to consider to recommendation 5A that we just discussed. Uh, we think that many of these would benefit from additional yeah. stakeholder engagement. And those questions include, but certainly are not limited to, on the side of, uh, you know, for advanced fee administration, who should administer the funds? Who should pay? How much should the fee be? How should it be calculated? What about the administrative costs? How are the, the requirements for the recycling protocols that we're suggesting be required of third party owners be developed? As I think I mentioned on that slide, would they be merely filed with, with DEEP uh, or, or some other agency or, or actually reviewed as well? If they would be filed and or reviewed with whom, et cetera. On the decommissioning side, by what mechanism would decommissioning plans be made mandatory and enforced? Again, to our understanding, those plans are common practice uh, at the commercial or utility scale, but are not required by by statute at present. Um, they're often a requirement of the lenders, you know, be behind the project. So that would need to be dug into further as to how that would how that would work in practice. And of course, putting aside the mechanics of it, what would be the requirements for those plans themselves, as with the third party owned residential systems, would they be filed or also reviewed by some party? And if so, by whom? Next slide, please. With respect to extended producer responsibility, obviously there's quite a lot of infrastructure that would need to go along with that as well. Who would collect and track manufacturing volumes? Who would review and if applicable approve stewardship plans? How would the program be structured so that uh, the roles and responsibilities of regulation and operation are separate. And then there are a number of overarching considerations. One of the one of the most important ones that we are still working on getting to the bottom of is which, if any of these recommendations can be implemented without legislative amendments versus those that require a bill to be introduced in the legislature. What data collection is needed prior to implementing any or all of these recommendations and who should collect that data? What sort of consideration should be given to the, the staging or the, the timing of implementing these recommendations? What to do with projects or sites that are already in operation or which have already been manufactured and brought into the state? Should policy only be applicable on a go-forward basis? If it's applicable retroactively, what to do with funding the recycling of that product where no fee has been collected for recycling and you know, no tracking or allocation has been made for the recycling costs? How should that work? And then with respect to the suggestion that we've had to further educate customers and installers on recycling, how would that work and who should carry that out? Uh, again, I can pause here if there's any questions. The next few slides 
set out at a, quite a high level some of the key dependencies and the, the interplay between all of the items that we've discussed thus far. But before I go there, again, any questions or comments on what we've presented so far? OK, I think we can move along then. Key dependencies for implementation. Again, I'm not sure it's necessary to go through each of these bullets sort of line by line because we will be sending out the deck, but we did just want to give as a kind of at a high level some of our thinking as to how these recommendations and mesh with each other and, and the interplay between them. Segmentation um, is something that is a kind of all, all, the, all the other recommendations sort of flow from this one. So uh, this would need to be agreed upon in order to move forward with the other recommendations as we've presented them. Um, Obviously, if you know if there were a desire to do more or less segmentation at the end of the day, then all of the other recommendations would need to be adjusted accordingly. Recommendations five, so those are the ones that I presented last there, the enabling or complementary recommendations. Those can be initiated uh, almost right away for the most part. The working group, you know there's no there's no reason why that couldn't continue in short order after the end of our uh, our dedicated sessions. Uh, the roster of state approved recyclers that could be initiated uh, in short order. And then supporting the federal efforts, uh, the EPA's efforts. We also believe that that's something uh, that could be the, the support for the EPA there also could be expressed uh, sooner rather than later, although that is also a formal process that's subject to uh, all the milestones that go along with, with rulemaking at the EPA level. Next slide. With respect to the, the the advanced fee administration recommendation at the residential level for, for solar panels, obviously um, the segmentation precedes that. The input from the working group as it if and if and when it continues would would be of great uh, insight and input into that. The roster of state approved recyclers, waste classification, all of that feeds it. And very similarly at the commercial level. Next slide. With respect to recycling of batteries, the, the EPR framework that we're recommending, much as with solar panels, uh, as that framework is being fully developed, it would benefit from uh, recommendations one, five A, B, and D. And with respect to the sub recommendation five D, uh, potentially considering banning the landfill disposal similarly would, would benefit from the input of waste classification, however that ultimately uh, is determined, and roster of approved recyclers. And we did want to flag um, this is also something that could require legislation. That takes us through the bulk of our presentation. If we could go to the next slide, uh, that, that takes us to our discussion session. So that was quite a lot to have covered in 30 minutes. So maybe, again, I'll pause here and open it up to the floor for questions, comments, reactions. Melissa, please go ahead. I hesitate to say anything only because um, I represent the solar industry and there are things they're going to like in this and things that they will have concerns about. But I my overarching comment is that um, this is one of the most thorough and in-depth and thoughtful uh, assessments of recycling that I've seen. And I've looked at a lot of these um, and I appreciate the work you all did on this. Um, and I appreciate you hearing us on the decommissioning thing because that is just so significant. Um, and I think that going about it in this way is the way that, you know, as someone who feel strongly that we learn from our history and other uh, fossil fossil fuels and other things, but without shooting ourselves in the foot as we try to meet climate goals, um, this is a very useful assessment. Thank you. We have plenty of time left in our meeting, so happy to Happy to either wait a few minutes in case anybody else has anything they wanted to chime in with. Otherwise, we really only have one slide remaining, and that's on the next steps uh, for both uh, both at our end and 
uh, in terms of the working group. Andrew, the slides have just disappeared. So maybe if we could get the last slide back up there while we're oh, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Know. Just just for the discussion yeah. period. Yeah, just um, in, in regards to battery re recycling and so forth, because our specialty is energy storage and so forth. Um, are there are you going to have like recommendations put in um, for the for the places that they s store the batteries? Uh, you know, they have to, you know, all the different things that go in to handle damaged batteries. If there's a fire, how the batteries are packaged or are, are, are all of those going to be part of your rec going forward? I don't expect that they will be. Our recommendations as as set out here, those are the bulk of our recommendations and they're largely again at the high level in terms of the end of life management framework. I think specific sort of safety considerations around transportation and storage of batteries, if, which I, I, if I've understood you correctly is what you're what you're referring to, I think would be largely out of scope for what we've done thus far. But that being said, if that's something that you think we should be thinking about in a way that we perhaps haven't, we'd be happy to to schedule a chat with you uh, to, to delve into that a little bit more. Yeah, I, th I think it would be a good thing to to chat about later. I could give you some things offline if you want, but you know, there's an awful lot of uh, batteries that are uh, catching fire with um, we, out here. It's Marburg who's picks up all the trash, but you know, there's other waste management companies, and they have a lot of uh, batteries that are in the in the fires. But also batteries that are just sitting in a warehouse waiting to be recycled. They may sit there for six months from the recycler as they as they hold them up uh, to collect them and those those could um, catch fire. So I think there should be certain recommendations on how those are are stored properly. So. OK, thank you for flagging that. That's all I did. Yeah, but you, you can catch me off, offline. I can give you recommendations. Daniel, go ahead. Hey, Avi, this is Daniel Zotos with Redwood Materials. I think I'm three for four on these calls. I, I did miss the last call um, and really appreciate the presentation and just the degree of thought and research that's gone into this. Um, just for others on the call, Redwood Materials, were one of the largest lithium ion battery recyclers in North America. We have operations in Northern Nevada and operate across states in terms of consumer battery recycling, you know, your smaller format batteries, electric vehicle batteries, and energy storage. Um, we've been pretty intimately involved in a lot of the EV battery management policy frameworks that have just sort of initially, you know, come up. I know I've met with Andrew and, and you folks directly on some of our work, but I guess overall, I'm just curious, and I know there's gonna be some more time to dig into this next on the next call as well is the extended producer recommendation on batteries is that as explicit um, in terms of what you're prescribing for producer responsibility organizations and a third party structure or have you not considered that and i guess just to be candid we redwood is adamantly opposed to having a pro for larger format batteries given the commercial opportunity and the market response. I'm just curious to to see the direction in terms of degree of recommendation. Would you like me to take that one, Andrew, or did you want to? Uh, let 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 me try that one. Is uh, Dan what what we've what we've talked about there is it it probably is something that we should um, we should discuss in our recommendations. And what we've talked about is that uh, there would be uh, an opportunity for both. In in other words, in other words, any any individual company could have their own stewardship plan. Uh, but then, if there are companies that would be that would want to be part of a PRO, then there would also be a PRO organization as well. So. So we we were we were thinking, you know, kind of 
keep everyone happy. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you've got feedback on that, and you know if if that's a feasible option. But that's how we were thinking about it internally. Yeah, I guess I would. Uh, that's good to hear in terms of degree of flexibility. I guess my initial remarks on that are we we continue to stand behind the data and the partnerships um, supporting the lack of a need for a PRO for the higher value batteries at end of life here, you know, specifically if we're talking about energy storage. And I'd also just note still early innings on the EV battery front, but a lot of similarities to account for here. Um, I know there's reference to the New Jersey bill that allowed for flexibility for a pro or direct extended producer sort of presentation of their plans with recyclers. So that's that's a workable model we view for New Jersey, but I'd also just, you know, caution or comment on the fact that California is still working on the EV battery issue ongoing and most recent conversations, drafts, feedback have actually, you know, tracked in the direction away from a PRO and really just honing in on pure play, extended producer responsibility with delineated management plans in partnership with qualified recyclers. So, you know, more nuance to all of that. I do think something that could work its way into recommendations um, could be some of the groundwork that's been laid, whether it's in New Jersey or California, you know, taking recommendations on the EV front, applying them to energy storage in terms of qualified recyclers. There's a lot of thought that went into the ascendant advanced battery manufacturing industry here in the United States, what that means to break the status quo in terms of offshoring of valuable critical minerals, how these policies stack up to federal incentives really aimed at recycled content targets. So there's definitions in the New Jersey bill for EV batteries, as well as drafts of the California bill that account for just that. And I think the same applies to energy storage in terms of state policy, augmenting and bolstering federal intention here. And, you know, I'm sure leave it up to the lawmakers, of course, but I think there's enough merit and nuance um, within that definition where it would probably make sense to address it in the, in the recommendations as well. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's great, great feedback. We haven't taken a look at the California, so um, I mean, if you happen to have that and could and could send it over to us, the the, the draft language or whatever, or we, we we you know we'd love to we'd love to take a look at that. So we'll we can either find it ourselves or if you happen to have it, just send it our way. Yeah, I'm happy to follow up. I'd say that the California legislation is evolving by the hour at this point. I think the more durable and understandable definition for what I'm mentioning was found in the New Jersey law on EV battery management, um, okay. which a lot of nuance across the board here once again, and Redwood's position has been heeding caution in terms of over prescribing management here with producer responsibility, but still putting scaffolding in place in terms of landfill bans and better defining process so that the industry is held to a higher standard for final disposition. And this is a conversation um, that was had extensively in New Jersey on the EV front. Once again, I know this is a different format we're discussing here, but I do think there's a workable um, and meaningful effort that was put into place there that is pr prescriptive, but also allows for market response. And you know, I know, I know there's a lot of nuance to that as well, but just, just a few comments overall. I know I've made these comments a few times, but figured it was worth mentioning the definition and, and the rationale behind that, as opposed to just you know, some of these more traditional EPR schemes with PRO models that have typically and traditionally been applied to negative value waste streams instead of inherent value, commercially viable, um, aspects like lithium ion batteries on this scale and magnitude as well. Okay, great. Thank you. I think Roger was next. Roger, please go ahead. Oh, great. Thanks, Avi. Thanks, Andrew. And just wanted to again echo, you know, thanks 
I know uh, I had a lot to say on the last call. I'll try and be briefer today, but uh, you know, appreciate you taking the time to to recognize the existing frameworks that are out there and successful. We don't have to reinvent the wheel left, right, and center. Um, I think one element that I would encourage is to not view, um, as it was presented here, the landfill disposal ban as a separate recommendation, I think kind of echoing what Daniel was saying, that is a critical element to making any of these schemes work. I don't think you can really have, expect any system, whether it's voluntary or PRO, to be effective unless you mandate that the batteries go there, right? Um, so I think having the landfill ban and an out-of-state landfill ban, you can't just export them to a landfill, is really I would encourage you to make that not a separate recommendation, but an integral recommendation to all of these schemes. Like that, that, I think that's um, that's fundamental. And I think where you know balancing a PRO versus an open market, I think you know I I'll, I'll lodge my continued necessary disagreement with the PRO approach, but PRO approach where Market players can choose their own adventure as long as they're adhering to the requirements. I think is an is an appropriate amendment to a mandatory PRO. I think that it's the it's the truly mandatory PRO type schemes we see out there that are, um, you know, fundamentally I think depress recycling rather than encourage it. Lonnie, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Lonnie Garris from Cool Amps Energy Solutions. This is my second meeting. I'm not sure if this has been discussed, but I was wondering if Connecticut has a position on uh, recycled batteries and where they ultimately end up, like not going to, you know, competitive nations, only IRA friendly type nations. Uh, does Connecticut have a position on that? Yeah, I, that, so that's not something we power advisory has been in our scope, uh, but um, I'm not sure if anyone on the on the line from uh, the Green Bank would like to address that. Sorry, Andrew, I missed the last part of Lonnie's call. Can you reiterate for me or question? Yeah, it, he was he was just asking whether there's any restrictions on uh, where batteries go in terms of Lonnie, sorry, was it was it like overseas markets? Were you saying? Yeah, that some recyclers may send to you know overseas recyclers, and then you know it's out of uh, U.S. hands. It could go to a non-IRA friendly nation, and you know I think that's not where, where we want to go. We want if if it's going to go outside the continental U.S., it should go to an IRA friendly nation. Oh, you're actually talking about a battery that's going to be recycled. I, I, I thought you were talking about a second life battery, but um, like just, yeah, okay. Recycled, it, yes. Yeah. I mean, so, so Sarah, I'm not sure if we've talked a whole lot about that, but generally within, our, within the Power Advisory team, uh, we've felt that the requirement ought to be that um, the recycling ought to happen in the U.S., um, but would love to you know, hear your, your thoughts on that. That's the call that you can tell. Yeah. I think that was a question back to Lonnie. I too would like to hear thoughts from this working group on that. Um, I, I, I think that this is getting a little bit beyond the scope of it because um, that would be part of actually designing sort of like the EPR framework or, um, you know, administering uh, whatever we end up recommending. But if there's if there's opinions specific to sort of where um, the material is processed, um, we certainly can capture that as part of this record. So, Lonnie, I think I think it'd be fair to say you're you're suggesting that it uh, it should be recycled in the U.S. or or I think you said an IRA friendly country. That's correct. Okay. 
there's a number of hands up. So maybe if anybody has a direct response to Lonnie's comment, maybe we'll we'll do those first. And then if there's additional comments or questions on other topics, we'll we'll, we'll go back to the list. Yeah, Bobby, so, I think I think I'm next in the queue. I got a direct response. Uh, Dan yeah, Soto's then, Redwood Materials again. Um, so Lonnie's question somewhat harkens to the point I was just making on this call where I know these are just recommendations and there's an exploration of EPR more generally, but the point I was making about where certain EPR frameworks have gone a step further that we are where we would be supportive as a battery recycler is in the definition of recycling or a qualified recycler itself. I can't quite comment on the efficacy or degree of Lonnie's comment on what sounds more of like an export ban, which invites a lot of other difficult questions state by state and how that would work. But at least with what the work Redwood and the advocacy work we've done across the supply chain and certain definitions as they apply to EV batteries, the focus has been on the process, the how batteries are recycled really honing in on refining capabilities domestically, essentially solves for some of Lonnie's concerns he mentioned here. So that was really the mainstay of the points I made earlier on this call about the importance of exploring that definition that was facilitated and enshrined in the New Jersey EV battery bill that's being significantly contemplated in the current pending California EV battery bill and translating that to energy storage EPR, which in my opinion is quite similar in terms of the need to uphold a certain standard of recycling process. And that definition really points to domestic recycling and refining capabilities and trying to, you know, really onshore the supply chain and pivot away from this black mass offshoring model that has really left us in the in the gulch for, for quite some time is how I put it. So just a few more comments to build on that. Um, I think it should be helpful. Thanks, Steve, you're number three. You're next on the list. Was your comment about uh, a response to Lonnie or? Yeah, yeah, real basically um, in the US, we you could structure it in such a way that that it's the geographically uh, most close facility to uh, Connecticut rather than having the batteries shipped, you know, to Reno, Nevada or to some other, you know, there's places that are relatively close. So that may be part of the charter. And then the other thing is there are going to be um, chemistries that are not able to be recycled in the US. And so to to put that as a restriction that it must be done in the US, it's not going to happen. There could be collectors in the U.S. that will send them overseas, but there will there are certain chemistries like the sulfur batteries or sodium batteries that they can't do it in the U.S. right now, and others and older technologies too, like um, like um, NICAD can no longer be done in the U.S. So I think you may want to add that as a as a clause if it can't be done in the U.S. You know, yeah, go for it. Thank you, and Roger. Yeah, so um, I just switching gears a little bit on the, this is an export related response. I think I would really strongly encourage you to not make that a recommendation to Deep. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years dealing with Basel Convention restrictions on exports. Um, even the federal government struggles to do that constitutionally. Um, there are some very strong U.S. constitutional requirements. People may re remember that the British were trying to prevent the U.S. from selling cotton to other countries, and our founding fathers had some very strong disagreements with export controls. Um, long story short to say, I think that is a kettle of fish that is far larger than a single state can take on. The U.S. isn't even a signatory to the Basel Convention. Um, to Daniel's point, I agree, though, that setting performance criteria for the destination recycling facilities is the way to go. You're going you, because that is enforceable against the individual authorized in Connecticut to do collection if they send it to an unauthorized or a non-performing 
recycling facility. But I think geographic restrictions, whether it's distance, you're going to run into um, interstate commerce clause issues if you're trying to do within the U.S. geographic and export controls. Um, you'd, you'd wind up sending Connecticut into Supreme Court jurisdiction land for the next 20 years. Um, we've been trying to deal with that on the lead battery side for 15 years, and it's um, uh, more power to you if you can crack that nut, but I, I, would, I would caution you against recommending it. Daniel. I'll just very quickly double down on my comments. Completely agree with Roger, but I had just raised my hand on the previous um, comments about the geographic precedent. I think that's that's a dangerous and slippery slope. It should be performance based. Um, just given you know everything Roger just mentioned, you know we don't want to hamstring the supply chain just based off of a geographically convenient location versus those who are doing this the most cost effective and quality process way for the environment and for the supply chain. Domestically, of course. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Are there any comments on any of the other items that we've discussed today or in previous meetings for that matter? All right, Andrew, could we get the last slide back up just in terms of the next steps very briefly? Thank you for for that discussion. In terms of where we're at, um, as I think I mentioned a few minutes ago, what we presented today is, you know, our, from our perspective, the recommendations are largely complete. There has been some additional input that we've just received here, which we'll take back uh, and consider. And then we're we're intending really in the next just in the next few weeks to finalize the complete report, which includes both the recommendations again, largely as you've seen them now, um, and the background material, the research that we've done, everything has previously been presented to the working group. And the the form of our final report will largely be a a, a combination of everything that has been presented at this working group over the last few months. Roger, did you have a question? Just really quickly so that we can socialize internally. Will you, since these are basically final recommendations, are you going to circulate a copy of today's deck? Yes. So the deck, the deck, and I believe the decks for all the working group meetings are posted on the Connecticut Green Bank website. Um, so that would just be the deck that we presented today. But in addition, uh, I believe that the intent of the Green Bank is to circulate the complete draft report, which is uh, at present running I think close to 200 slides, uh, so please budget some time to review that. Uh, we as once that's complete, uh, we will likely be circulating that full report, which includes the recommendations, what we, all, all of what we just discussed today, uh, in early July. Recognizing that there uh, is a holiday coming up, we will endeavor to get that out to you as soon as possible. We are open and remain available to receive either written feedback or continue to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with, with working group members through the first three weeks of July. The report must be submitted to Pura by August 1st at the latest. So while we do have uh, you know, some, some weeks left for, for, for comments, final revisions, edits, and we do have a working group meeting on July 17th, uh, we we are, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, rapidly approaching the end of our process. So uh, once you receive the final report or once you had a chance to, once this deck is posted and you've had a chance to review the these recommendations specifically, uh, please do get back to us if you have any questions, concerns, suggestions, recommendations as soon as you can. I don't believe we received any written comments uh, on the previous working group's deck, the previous meeting, the, the previous working group meetings deck, in which the recommendations were quite similar but not identical to what was presented here. So there is there is certainly opportunity to do so still, but again, we are approaching the end of our of our process. Um, and that largely takes us through through this meeting. 
Uh, Sarah, did you have any closing remarks either for the meeting overall or with respect to the process specifically? Um, no, I just wanted to note that we do have our final working group meeting on July 17th. So we will we will be reconvening one more time um, prior to our submission to PIRA. Um, and yes, we the Green Bank is actually completing our review of the recommendations right now, and then it will go out to the rest of the working group um, following the July 4th holiday. So we look forward to your comments and feedback. Um, uh, I'll be working with Andrew and the team to set a deadline for your comments and feedback <laughs> um, that will communicate out when we when we send it um, but uh, it's great content um, it is essentially a, a combined PowerPoint deck of the content that we have presented over the past four meetings including this one with updates additional comments that we've heard uh, as we've gone so um, yeah we look forward to hearing from you um, thanks for joining today and appreciate the conversation um, Valesa appreciate the um, pat on the back for this being a great uh, process. That's certainly been my impression of it so far. And I think that's, you know, in part because of the wonderful power advisory team, but also because of all of you um, being willing to devote your um, time and attention to this this process in Connecticut. So thank you very much. Um, Andrew, Avi, anything else to close us out? That's everything. I'll set up. Yeah, I'll set on my end. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. We'll great. talk to you again in the middle of July.